Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, the next uh, keynote uh, will be given by uh, David Ha. Uh, David uh, is a research scientist at uh, Google Brain uh, Tokyo. Uh, his research interests uh, include the recurrent neural networks, uh, creative AI, and evolutionary computing. Uh, prior to joining Google, uh, he worked at uh, Goldman Sachs as a managing director in Japan. Uh, he obtained undergraduate and uh, grad uh, degrees in engineering science and applied math uh, at the University of Toronto. In his most recent uh, research paper, Neuroevolution of uh, Self-Interpretable Agents, uh, um, which received the best paper award at uh, Gecko, uh, his theme is uh, evolving artificial agents uh, with uh, self-attention bottleneck uh, that can solve uh, tasks uh, from pixel inputs with only a few thousand parameters. Uh, Notably, these agents uh, uh, are very good at generalization to unseen variations of uh, the training tasks. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's the introduction, and now it's uh, up, to, up to David. Uh. Oh, okay, uh, thanks for the very kind introduction, Thomas. Uh, just to check, can, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, cool, I'm gonna go ahead with the talk. So I'm really honored uh, to be giving a talk at A-Life today. My name is David Ha, and I'm a research scientist at Google in the brain research team in Tokyo. Uh, so, you know, while Google is well known for its machine learning research, I actually became interested in AI many years ago as a hobbyist uh, due to the artificial life and evolutionary computation community. So I'm really happy to be here. So before I... Uh, talk about world models and attention, I want to give a brief background about uh, uh, some of my background and my journey into my AI research. And I think that helps it uh, put some context into the works that I'll discuss later. So many years ago, I discovered some slides and materials related to AI life and evolution, like this set of slides from uh, Risto McLennan that gave me an introduction and overview of neuroevolution. Uh, to me, AI is all about things like artificial agents, robots, control systems, artificial creativity, and video games, like fun stuff, rather than things like classification problems on data sets. And for me, the best way to learn something is to try to build something on my own. So uh, back then, I took some of the concepts from artificial evolution and AI life and built some fun web demos, like this clone of slime volleyball with neural network agents trained using self-play. Another other concept of uh, survival and reproduction in a life as uh, intrinsic goals in uh, multi-agent environments also fascinated me. And I made this silly demo called uh, Creatures Avoiding Planks, where these uh, Reynolds voids like creatures moved around and died when they touched one of these planks. Uh, but over time, the ones that survived long enough would naturally avoid the killer planks and uh, also bump into each other to form offsprings that also had a tendency to avoid these killer planks and bump into each other and so on and so forth. Uh, I also played around with implementing the NEATS algorithm uh, developed by Ken Stanley, uh, a way to find neural network topologies and architectures and combine it with backprop. And this kind of inspired uh, some of the research at Google in 2016 to produce what uh, many call now the neural architecture search. But to me, I was mainly interested in the morphology of these networks rather than training the weights, even using backprop. Uh, I played around with implementing this uh, CPPN meets uh, as an interactive web browser demo and created some funky looking art, some of which I printed out and decorated my apartment with. And a few years later in my research career, uh, my collaborator, Adam Geyer, who I met at Gecko, uh, and I revisited Meets, and we tried to evolve these uh, so-called uh, weight agnostic neural networks that can still perform in some reinforcement learning open AI benchmark tasks, even when the networks use random weights. So getting back to, you know, when I decided to become a machine learning researcher at Google, I began to review a bit on the data science stuff again. Like, like everyone else, I started to play with the digit classification task on the MNIST data set. But as you can see, it is not the most inspiring problem in the world. But, you know, eventually, uh, we eventually went through great pains not to use gradient descent to train neural networks to classify MNIST because it's, it's kind of uh, fun not to. Uh, here, 
uh, we evolved a weight agnostic neural network architecture that is able to classify MNIST even when the network is initialized to random weight values. Uh, this one here got around 90% accuracy, which is far below the state of the art. But still, we were able to publish this work at, like a, at a conference like NeurIPS. So while I'm not a fan of classification tasks, I am fascinated with generative models. Uh, I'm much more interested in using machine learning models to generate things rather than classifying images. Uh, the thing I went to learn next, uh, let's see, there's a chat here. Okay, sorry. Uh, the thing I went to learn next was building generative models on the MNIST data sets. So I ended up building this MNIST VAE GAN model that can output really high resolution samples of MNIST. It has to imagine what MNIST digits look like between the digits, between the pixels. Uh, with dimensions, these dimensions can be arbitrarily high. So this was actually back in 2016 when GANs and VAEs were still confined to producing images that were relatively low resolution, like 64 by 64 pixels before they really took off in a few years. Uh, I was able to do this because I incorporated ideas like CPPNs that I learned from meets from the A-Life and Evolution uh, community. So basically the theme of my research career is like combining the best ideas from evolution and the ideas from deep learning and trying to do new things with them. Uh, later on, uh, I became interested in sequence generation models and did some work on using sequence generation to produce vector drawings of like things like children doodles, which are composed stroke by stroke by a neural network. Uh, later, my colleagues at DeepMind also created a similar system uh, but uh, unlike mine, they train it using the, grain, the GAN framework, where the generator is a stroke drawing agent, and they trained it also on the ImageNet data set. So I'm really interested also in these sequence models and also the concept of doodling, because there are some analogies with how we ourselves develop abstract representations of everyday things. So this, all of this work eventually led me to explore the space that combines generative models with reinforcement learning. And the line of work related to uh, world models and self-attention for reinforcement learning, which I will discuss for the remainder of this talk. So my work on world models was inspired by the cognitive science domain. Uh, you know, our mental models made up of our unique experiences determines how we interpret the world. Uh, but they also affect our actions, how we assess opportunities and help us solve problems in our, in our everyday lives. So in a sense, how we look at the world is through the lens of our mental world models. And in my work, I looked at building generative models of uh, visual game environments, environments where the observation space is a grid of pixels. So I also try to train agents to look at their world through the lens of their own generative world models. Well, Yan LeCun, a pioneer in deep learning, had this nice quote on the problem he thinks with reinforcement learning. So he said, if you use a pure reinforcement learning to learn, uh, to train an agent to drive a car, it's going to have to crash into a tree 40,000 times before it figures out that it's a bad idea. Instead, they need to learn their internal models of the world so they can simulate the world faster than real time. He likes to say that reinforcement learning is kind of like the cherry of the cake. But also in the, in the area of consciousness studies, uh, it's a domain of like a neuroscience, uh, the global workspace theory proposes that con conscious processing revolves around a communication bottleneck between selected parts of the brain, which are called upon when addressing current tasks. Uh, so in this book, uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, uh, Dehani also wrote that consciousness has a precise role to play in the computational economy of the brain. It selects, amplifies, and propagates relevant thoughts. Uh, in my work, I view world models as a means to enforce something like a communication bottleneck for the artificial agents. 
And these tools like latent space representations and attention can basically help select, amplify, and also propagate relevant information for the agents. Uh, many researchers have also been inspired by uh, this book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by economist uh, Daniel uh, Kahneman, where the key idea is that our thinking is divided into system one or instinctive thinking that captures our raw animal instincts and ability to quickly react. And system two, which captures uh, higher order thinking involving planning or imagination. As I described later on though, uh, I believe that role models are not only associated with system two, like the slow thinking, but it's an integral part of both systems. So when I started this work, I looked at using only the very basic uh, building blocks uh, to build simple generative models for RL agents. Uh, the, the first generative models that I built uh, have, have, has to have uh, an abstract representation of time and space. Uh, I use a simple variational autoencoder like this one to learn a low dimensional latent representation of pixel observation frames. For the representation of time, I use a recurrent neural network uh, trained to predict the future. Like this sketch RNN model used to predict future strokes of a pen uh, drawing these doodles, we can use a recurrent neural network to predict the distribution of future latent vectors from the variational autoencoder that I just described. And by sampling from this distribution, we can get the model to imagine different future possibilities. So I'll, I'll first go over my thoughts on how world models can be used for system one type instinctive behaviors for our agents. So usually uh, in, in a reinforcement learning environments, uh, that is a visual environment, we are provided with an observation, which is a pixel frame at every time step. And here, uh, our agents would collect uh, a data set of these pixel frame sequences uh, at, the, at the beginning using like a random policy. And we would train using a variational autoencoder uh, to compress uh, these high dimensional latent, uh, these high dimensional uh, pixel frames into a low dimensional latent vector or floating point number Z. For, so for every frame, it can be compressed uh, using like a 32 dimensional number uh, vector Z. And then since we have the sequence data, we can train a recurrent neural network like the sketch RNN model to predict uh, or to model the distribution of future Zs given its own state, which is like a, which is like a, a, a representation of time of what has happened in the past. So the hidden states of the recurrent neural network, uh, which is also relatively low dimensional, it will be our representation of time. But now our agents, uh, the controller C, uh, will not actually see the observations, will not see any grids or pixels, but will instead see a concatenated uh, Z and H vectors. So the representation of space and time, uh, which is relatively low dimensional. And from this concatenated vector, it has to output uh, the action. So in, in this uh, work, we made C to be a very simple linear controller event. So it's just a, it's a linear policy with not a lot of parameters. And it has to output an action that goes back into the environment in order to, to perform some task. So we applied this uh, method to a car racing game in the open AI gym suites. Back in 2018, at the time of this work, this method was actually the first that was able to solve the task and achieve an average score above the required performance. You can notice that while the VAE and the RNN combined have millions of parameters, the actual linear controller making the decisions only has less than a thousand parameters, kind of like resembling the cherry on a cake. Because the, the number of parameters is so low, we can even use evolution strategies or, or anything to train the controller, like you know, even using random search. Uh, while you, we use uh, the back propagation algorithm and deep learning to train the world model like the VAE and the RNN from the data. And here we show that the agent can still drive around the track uh, if, if we only give it the representation of space from the VAE, like the Z vector, but hide the RNN's information. Uh, but although here the, the information still tends to wobble a lot, but it still drives around the track. 
But when we give the agent both representations of time and space, uh, it's able to learn a good policy to solve the task and we can attack these sharp corners taking advantage of the temporal uh, information from the RNN. So this is basically like using the, the world model as a system one style feature, feature extractor to give it meaningful information to do the task. So, so far we showed that this world model can be used as a, as a bottleneck and a useful feature extractor for an RL agent. Uh, but since the world model is also a generative model, uh, these representations also allow it to generate a version of the environment that can be used to train an agent. So which brings me to discuss uh, the use of world models for a systems two style approach uh, and discuss how we can train agents entirely inside of its own imaginary world. If we go back to the previous schematic, the setup still requires pixel observations from the actual environment. But since our model is able to predict and model the future observations in latent space, we can remove the actual environments and remove the pixels images entirely from the setup and use the world model to sample possible latent uh, space trajectories of the future. And we can train our agents entirely inside a latent space environment imagined by its world model and not using the actual environments and not using any uh, pixel images. So uh, we experiment with uh, this, this uh, simple Doom environment, also from OpenAI Gym, where the, where the objective for the agent is to avoid fireballs shot by monsters inside of a room uh, and survive as long as possible. So the result of this exp experiment is, uh, is uh, kind of fun. It's the result is a neural simulator I built of this specific Doom game, Doom game that we can actually play by ourselves. So back then, uh, I thought the idea of being able to play inside an imaginary neural network world is so interesting that I, I actually spent some time porting this model over to JavaScript and making this a web demo. That allows me to interactively try the neural simulator of Doom inside of a, of a web browser. Uh, this is probably the first neural simulator of a neural uh, of a visual game environment that runs inside a web page, but it's also probably the last because I don't think many people do this. Uh, I also put some knobs like being able to control the, the temperature or the uncertainty parameter, which allowed me to make a noisier version of the environment. And it turns out this to be this feature is quite useful for this uh, this research. So. Uh, as these models are just an approximation of their real environments uh, trained from the data collected, they're obviously not perfect. When we train an agent inside of the uh, world model, like the imaginary world, it's, it, it can learn that it can move in a weird way inside of the neural simulator so that the monsters in the room will never fire a single fireball, like, like, the, one, uh, like the animation on the left. And hence, it can live forever inside the dream. But such a policy that takes advantage of imperfections will obviously fail to transfer to the actual environment. But instead, like on the right, if we increase the uncertainty parameter of the world model and have it imagine a more chaotic version of the game, our agent is able to learn a policy inside this noisier, more difficult version of reality. And the policy is able to transfer to the actual game. So, uh, if the world models, like uh, if world models train on data collected from a random agents, uh, this, this has many uh, limitations because they cannot extrapolate well beyond what has been experienced by the agent so far. So for, for almost all environments that require even some form of exploration, we need the agent to continually update its world model from newly collected data whenever it interacts with the real world. So in, in this like an iterative training scheme, uh, like the carpool swing up from a pixel environment, the world model at the beginning doesn't even have a good idea of what happens when the carpool is swung upwards. Uh, but after it learns a policy from imagination, even though it's a really bad imagination, uh, it still attempts to swing upward. And when we deploy that policy to the actual environment, it will collect more data 
and this new data can be used to improve the world model. Uh, after 20 iterations or so, the world model learn uh, more accurate dynamics of the environment from pixels, and the agent is able to learn the task by training inside of the world model, you know, the, the improved world model. Uh, this concept of iteratively training uh, has been explored in a more detailed subsequent work uh, that was presented in this paper, which described the simple algorithm, where uh, the agent starts interacting with the real environments. Uh, at the beginning is, is a random policy. Uh, and then the, the collected observations uh, are stored and used to update the current world model. So the world model is always retrained on, on all of the, the data, including the newly collected data. And three, uh, the agent updates the policy by learning only inside of the world model uh, rather than learning performed on the actual environments. So this loop, uh, uh, like uh, when they apply this simple iterative training loop to a scaled up version of a world model optimized for predicting uh, next pixel frames, they applied, uh, this paper applied it to the Atari domain. Uh, back in 2018, 2019, when this work came out, this model-based method achieved quite good results for sample efficiency for, for learning several Atari games, uh, because actually most of the learning is done in imagination mode, as opposed to traditional RL when the, the learning is, is done on, on actual rollouts. Um, but while the interactions uh, you know, with the actual Atari game is only for collecting data, and, and uh, measuring the, the performance. The world models learned for these Atari games are actually so good that it's kind of difficult to tell between the actual environments and the generated one by the neural network. And as you can see here, like, uh, well, actually the, the one on the left, I think is the generated one, but then the one on the right is, is the, the real one, but it's kind of hard to tell. But because the predictive frames have some stochasticity, like, like the temperature that I described earlier, we can also compare the actual rollout from the Atari game with the generated version and see the differences over time. Uh, while differences do exist here, uh, both environments, the real and the imaginary one, tend to be internally self-consistent. So these uh, latent space world models also have been combined with a planning algorithm for, for the policy, like in traditional MPCs, uh, rather than using a neural network policy like, like the one that I used before. Uh, in this uh, later paper, uh, led by Danny J. Hefner, um, we showed that the planning in latent space allowed the controllers to solve cut these uh, continuous time control problems from only pixel observations and learn policies with better data efficiency compared to previous methods that rely on the state observations, like, like uh, relative positions, angles, and velocities, and so on. And here, it only works from, from a, a continuous stream of pixels. A recently improved version of this work, uh, called a Dreamer V2, uh, learns a discrete latent representation of the world. And they show uh, pretty good results in both Atari domain and also continuous uh, control domains. So this uh, Mujoko humanoid task, uh, some of us may be familiar with this if you played around with it, was actually once considered uh, a difficult task, a difficult benchmark, uh, even for a controller that had access to all of the state information in the environment, like position, torque, velocity, and ang angles, and so on. Uh, so this environment had like you know, more than a, around 100 observations and, and a few dozen actions, commands for the controller to basically control each of the motor joints. And here, uh, the agent learns behaviors to move the, to stand up and move forward uh, purely from the predictions in the compact latent space and can control the, this humanoid from a raw video footage. It's kind of like a, operating a remote controller of this humanoid robot by looking at it from a third person's perspective. Uh, it's like playing an RC video car controller, but, but uh, the difference is this humanoid controller has like you know, a couple of dozen 
um, controls, which makes it quite hard. Uh, you can see the trajectories in the actual environments on the, on the right, and the ones sampled and predicted in the latent space imaginary environments. And another interesting uh, world model neuro simulation projects uh, is this one, uh, is this neuro driving simulator from a team at NVIDIA that uses this, these, uh, well, NVIDIA's, they're, they're, they do a lot of work on these high quality GANs. So they combine up these high quality generative adversarial networks as part of their dynamics uh, prediction models trained to mimic a data sets uh, or, or like driving data sets uh, collected from US roads. They, so it's here, here is like a, this uh, neural network uh, where it's, a, it's driving along the highway and the, the user can actually you know, turn and take over cars, but I'm not sure what happens when the user tries to drive off road to be honest. Uh, they, they built an interactive simulator that people can drive inside of, and they can do things like control the weather, time of the day, and other driving conditions. So another uh, cool project is called a Path Dreamer, a world model for indoor navigation. So in this project, they train a world model on a data set of indoor scenes, and the neuro simulator uh, it's it's kind of like this uh, Google Maps style simulator, I think. Uh, that this uh, allows a user to uh, imagine indoor scenes and and move move inside them when the model is only given a single image to start it off, uh, and letting the user navigate around these hallucinated buildings in this uh, three sixty degree view. So far, uh, I discussed world models that use latent space representations. Now I want to discuss other types of bottlenecks that one might want to explore. But in, in latent space models, we typically have a generative model that encodes observations into these uh, low dimensional latent vectors with some prior distributions. Uh, and then the, the policy search uh, has to work with this uh, bottleneck this latent space bottleneck. But we can also use other forms of bottlenecks such as a uh, visual attention. Uh, so in this later work uh, led by my colleague, Eugene Tang, we train an agent to first identify a small set of patches, like, like five to 10 patches in the observation frame using a self attention bottleneck. And then uh, it has to decide on the action only from the information contained in this small set of patches. Uh, so we found that agents that train with a self-attention bottleneck not only can solve these tasks uh, from pixel inputs only uh, with only like a few thousand parameters, uh, which allows us to train these uh, non-differential policies using evolution. Uh, but these uh, agents are also better at out of training distribution generalization. So they can generalize to variations of these tasks. So this idea is inspired by some of the early work on a selective attention or intentional blindness in the psychology field. Uh, in this experiment from, uh, from Simmons, uh, the subjects are asked to count how many times the players in whites pass the ball. In, in, in an episode. So many of the participants uh, actually fail to notice the gorilla walking around because most of their attention is focused on the task at hand. So in our experiment, we also try to force this inattentional blindness as a bottleneck in our agents. So while the agent receives the full inputs, like, like on the left, uh, we actually force it to see its world through the lens of a self-attention bottleneck, uh, which it has to learn, or, and which picks only 10 patches from the input in the middle column. Uh, the, the final controller's decision to generate the actions is only based on these 10 patches on the right column. Our agents, uh, our, our agents here, like uh, in our experiments, show that they, uh, with inattentional blindness, they have better generalization abilities simply due to its ability 
uh, to not see things that can confuse it. Like for instance, it's able to drive in uh, brighter or dimmer conditions uh, in just car racing environments. Uh, also at the bottom, when, when it has an unexpected, unexpected sidebar uh, on both sides of the observation, uh, it's, able, it's also able to drive. So it's, it's like if, if our, our window suddenly becomes smaller or something. And also, if there's an unexpected red blob in the observation that, that can distract it, uh, it's also able to, to drive. And these are without training on any of these unseen variations. In the doom environments, the agent can also operate with, uh, with like an environment with a much higher wall, uh, or when the color of the floor is different, uh, or when there's like this annoying uh, blue blob with some text in the middle of the screen. So all of these variations would cause a traditional RO agent or even one trained with a latent space world model uh, to fail. Uh, but, but here it's able to succeed because it's, it's able to, do, to not see it. So while that was a, a cool work, we still have a long way to go. I think the, the area of uh, out of domain generalization is really important and there's a lot of work still to be done here. You know, we show also in the work that our agent uh, with this method still fails when we change the background uh, of the, the car racing tracks. And uh, so for, for this work, uh, you know, outside of the, the two tasks, we also trained this attention agent on other games in Tari and also on, on this uh, slime volleyball environment that I created earlier. And, uh, we can also see that the, the attention agent can learn to identify important patches or areas of the screen where it, it needs to perform the task. So th this also helps us with things like, you know, when it comes to interpreting what the agent is doing and, or even like what, whether it's missing something, maybe these, these sort of attention patches can also let us uh, give us a hint of this decision-making process. So lastly, in this presentation, uh, I want to discuss a recent uh, work uh, where I want to introduce the concept of using shuffling as a type of bottleneck constraints the attention must overcome. So we discussed a latent space bottlenecks, we discussed attention bottlenecks, but now I want to see if we can use, like, like whether we can just shuffle the screen and because that task is harder, it's also sort of like a bottleneck for the agents. And in this uh, recent work, uh, we pose this problem where we want to train an agent to accomplish its task, even when the observation space can be arbitrarily shuffled or even shuffled many times during an episode, during its life. Uh, like for example, here uh, in this car racing from pixels task, we can divide up the observation frames from the car racing environment into a, a grid of patches and then shuffle and, and occasionally reshuffle the ordering of these patches as shown on the right. So the right grid uh, of shuffled like uh, puzzle pieces is what the agent gets to work with. And the question is, uh, or our, our task here is, can we get a system to still be able to solve a task even when its observations consist of only these shuffled pieces. So in this uh, recent work of ours, uh, we've been experimenting with ideas uh, from combining ideas from self-organization and self-attention, like, like what I described earlier, to solve this type of problem. Uh, the key idea is to treat each sensory neuron uh, each, each neuron that receives input as an individual agent or an individual recurrent neural network agent and have each of these neurons a process an arbitrarily selected input stream. So let me get into some of the details. Uh, so the, the idea is like the sensory neuron is kind of like a, a transformer. And for each of these observations uh, that goes into each sensory neuron, these observations can be shuffled, uh, but each sensory neuron will be integrating the information coming from its uh, assigned input stream over time. They can also then 
broadcast a message out into a global latent code using an attention mechanism. So this is kind of inspired by the global workspace uh, theory that I, I was discussing earlier when uh, reading about the, the consciousness theory. So each sensory neuron broadcasts uh, a message which gets consolidated uh, and combined using an atten attention mechanism. And uh, the combination of this attention message messaging consolidation and the temporal information like the states of each RNN allows each of these sensory neurons to figure out a kind of roughly the context of, of its own input signal. And then the attention mechanism allows coordination between each of these individual sensory neurons uh, to, produce, to produce a, a coherent policy. So this work is also inspired by some of the older experiments uh, in, in psychology involving some of these uh, upside down goggles and uh, left right bicycle. Uh, so here you, you see the experiment is you wear this uh, upside down goggle and what you see is basically completely flipped uh, vertically. Uh, and it, it's kind of, it's really hard to, to move around and require some training. Or in a more recent TED talk, uh, this guy built, put an extra gear into the bike. So uh, when you want to go left, you actually have to steer right. And this completely messed up some of the participants. And it took people some time to, to adjust and, and learn how to, to ride these bicycles. But the point is, they can learn how to ride these bicycles. And eventually, the brain did adapt and the policies, uh, and they're, they're able to, to do the task eventually. So these subjects and these experiments are still able to learn to remap changes in the meaning of their sensory observation inputs, even when things get switched around. Also, there's this idea in neuroscience called sensory substitution. Uh, when uh, the pioneer Paul back uh, showed that blind people are able to replace their visual experience from transmitting a camera feed signal uh, like a, into a low dimensional 2D grid of pokes on the person's back. And a, a few decades later on, uh, you, he created uh, another experiment using an electrode array on a blind person's tongue. So in these experiments, uh, the subject, the blind subjects are still able to learn over time to remap visual information received from other sensory organs. But however, uh, the observation space uh, in most RL agents are well defined. And we don't really you know, expect the agents to, to work when we, we change the order of the observation vector, right? And it's kind of expected that the, the meaning of each observation in an RL environment is not going to change in an agent's life. But here, we want to see if we can explicitly train an RL agent to adapt uh, to a changing observation space. So in, in, a, vari in a variation of Atari Pong uh, called a puzzle Pong, the agent here must still be able to play the Pong game like on, just by looking at the stuff on the right, uh, when its input space is constantly shuffled, uh, like, like what we see here. So this uh, self-organization and self-attention allows the agent to treat the observation space as an unordered variable length stream of inputs. So the, the ideas from self-attention from the transformer of being able to process sets become very powerful in the context of our permutation invariant agents. Uh, so what we find as well is uh, the system is also able to be trained to perform, puzzle, uh, to perform on puzzle pong to some extent, even when it sees like a, something like 30% of the available shuffled puzzle pieces. Uh, what's remarkable here is that uh, even though the agent is only trained to see 30% of the puzzle pieces, when we give it more pieces, uh, when we give it more information, the performance will increase later on. But we can also apply this, uh, this concept to traditional RL environments with 
uh, state observation space, not uh, pixels. But here in this Pi Bullet Ant environment, there are 28 observations, like uh, seven per leg. And, and these are shuffled, the, the ordering of the observation vector that of 28 inputs are shuffled every 100 steps or so. And here, each of the RNN sensory neurons uh, quickly adapt to the new observation space uh, at every 1,000 time steps. Although we, we do kind of see it slow down a little bit. And lastly, we also uh, find some benefit of training agents to work on a shuffled observation space. I mean, come on, because simply like, um, you know, we, we do feel pressure to show that what we're doing is, is actually useful, right? So in this car environment that I showed earlier, uh, the, the base agent is trained to, to navigate on these uh, shuffled observations. But we find that in this environment as well, uh, these permutation invariant agents are also able to generalize well and perform in out of distribution tasks, like the one here when the background is changed. Uh, and here, like even when, when the agent has never seen the background before, it's trained on just the green background. Uh, so this type of random order bottleneck is kind of forcing the agents to learn uh, the essence of the task and also the essence of the environment, which gives it some uh, beneficial robustness and generalization properties uh, that we found, in addition to simply being able to work with uh, shuffled observation space, which was, is, is already, already quite challenging in the first place. So I think I'm at the 40 minute uh, points and uh, I think uh, I can, so this, uh, this concludes my talk today. Uh, before I finish, I also would like to introduce uh, our research group in Tokyo. Uh, we try to explore AI topics beyond deep learning and look at areas like artificial life and evolution, complex systems, and also uh, look at machine learning applied to the humanities, like in arts and culture. Thank you. Let me quit this presentation and stop, stop sharing this. Okay, okay. Okay, so, so thanks, uh, thanks, David, for, for the very nice talk. And uh, we can start uh, the question answering uh, uh, session now. I would even have like uh, the very first question myself. Uh, so because you were working over your career with uh, a lot of like different training algorithms like uh, evolution and reinforcement learning and uh, SGD, I would actually compare them because there's a lot of like scientists thinking uh, big claims about like, uh, I don't know, that the reinforcement learning itself is not enough to reach AI or that SGD is not enough and uh, that evolution is too slow. And uh, you did also work on combinations of these. So do you think that the, the final answer is the combination or is there even like some other thing that we should be looking at? Uh, so what are your opinions? Uh, well, like, uh, I, I don't think the combination of what I described is enough to, to get like, like uh, to, to achieve strong AI. Uh, but I think also uh, being able to, like, uh, to be exposed to the existing ideas allow us to come up with new concepts as well. Kind of like if we model the researcher as, as an open-ended agent uh, and may maybe we, we can come up with a, with a new thing. Uh, this is also why uh, in, in our lab, we also branch out to, to even talk to folks in the humanities. You know, just just to you know, look at look at what people are, are looking at when when interpreting historical documents, uh, because uh, you know I, I really think we need a, a open endedness uh, to to keep on you know, like a, not not explicitly trying to solve a particular goal, uh, but we need to be more open minded as a research community to get new ideas. And this, but this is a kind of a a, a controversial topic because there's there's been some. Uh, also, some papers about how the reward is all you need, you know, to, and and there's also some people that think reward is not all you need. So, but it's good to have this diverse opinion because the arguments mm. create progress, right? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely the, the like uh, uh, like diversity of the ideas uh, is very important component in the in the research community. Okay, so for the further questions, uh, I already see that there's quite a few of them. So the first one. Uh, so uh, it's from Takeshi Ikegami. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, the bottleneck is a very important part of learning. Why do you think uh, that is? Uh, 
GPT-3 seems uh, not to use uh, this idea. I also think that bottleneck is also important in evolution, as we discussed before, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's like, like we, like what I, what I discussed with you earlier, there's kind of two schools of thought, right? But one is uh, uh, the bottleneck type of way is, is like, it's coming from, uh, from this, uh, what's it's called? Like when I talked to Schmidt Huber about this earlier, like he he liked to propose the idea of of this uh this minimal description length and from information theory. So when when you when you're able to decompose a problem, uh, that's really difficult into uh, two parts where you, you can kind of uh, de decompose the information into a sh the shortest path. It's it's easier. To, you constrain the solution space and you're able to easily find problem. So sure, maybe in some of these RL environments, the the agents can still do all of this stuff uh, with enough compute when it has access to the entire pixel. But maybe by constraining it, uh, by having these priors like attention and latent space, uh, it's able to quickly find the solution uh, compared to the brute force approach. But the, the, the other view is, uh, you know, we're, we're these, some of these models like the transformer can be scaled so efficiently. Like it simply wants to work with, with more data. And like, uh, we, we may not even want to go about looking at the, the bottlenecks because we don't even know how, what's the limitations of scaling. So we have the other folks on the other end of the spectrum, like open AI, who look, wants to look at scaling laws. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we need to look at both. We want to look at the limitations of scaling, but maybe at some point when, when they do find some limitations on on some of these scaling parameters, uh, we, we could find like ways to incorporate bottlenecks uh, in order to, to make them better. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, the next question is from uh, Olaf Mitkowski, and he's asking if there is some promising method to find gorilla attention bottlenecks uh, that uh, ideally optimally prove uh, uh, improve uh, learning uh, versus uh, attentional filters uh, that fail to lead uh, to out-of-domain generalization. Well, th yeah, th that's a good question. Like, uh, so for for the the blind, it, the inattentional attention work, the uh, the selective attention work that I presented, uh, what happens here is the the attention is also part of the policy, so it's actually a hard attention scheme. Uh, so the agent actually. Uh, is trained using evolution. So it's trained end to end uh, so that the, the, the hard attention scheme is trained together with the controller. So it has to learn to select uh, the, the, the right patches for the task. So we, in that sense, we cannot view the controller as the, the only part of the policy. The entire thing is a policy. But what I think Olaf is asking is, can attention be used to to facilitate like, like a generalization or, or in general, learn to select things that improve learning in general. So, so rather than the task is not simply driving around the track, but maybe the task is the task of learning. And maybe we can like in certain environments, we can try to, to evolve or to learn these schemes of identifying attention patches to optimize for learning. And no, I, I, ha I haven't been too aware of these, these works, but I think that that would be a very interesting direction, like kind of applying these uh, hard attention or even attention models to, to meta learning. Uh, and you, you, you basically want to find the attention scheme that optimizes learning where, the, where you're not doing any particular task. The task itself is the learning task. Okay, thanks for the answer. The next question, question is uh, from uh, Nicolas uh, Gutenberg, uh, asking about the experiments that you were presenting, uh, whether the input sensors are themselves recurrent neural networks, uh, allowing them to figure out something like a positional encoding from the content, or uh, if, uh, is, uh, if that is, uh, in, uh, if uh, information co is completely masked uh, before the attention layer. Okay, let me think. So for, for that one, uh, the observation space is, is say completely shuffled and the agents, uh, 
the each individual neuron receives a stream of input over time. So like uh, in our scheme, the, the individual neuron sensory neurons are LSTMs that, that can just, that only see a stream of inputs uh, over time. So it, at the beginning, it doesn't know where it is, but uh, what, uh, so it doesn't even know where the position is right? because it has to figure it out it, from a, it's, it's randomized. But what, what we find is uh, from the attention uh, consolidation produces this latent like uh, code that produces the action. What, what we find is uh, we can use that we, to, to evaluate our system. We can use that to, to see if we can train train a downstream network to back out the positional encoding. So we find that, uh, like for example, in, in the bullet and task, uh, the, the position, like the, the self-organization is able to learn some approximation of the environment with the positional information, even though each neuron does not know any positional information uh, to begin with. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, then the next uh, question is from uh, Federico Pigosi, and uh, he's asking uh, whether anybody ever tried to implement distributed uh, world models, uh, like world models uh, for agents composed of uh, uh, as uh, aggregations uh, of uh, simple building blocks. Uh. Oh, I think uh, from from the literature I've seen, there there has been like these like uh, multi agents uh, world models. Uh, not just in the Doom environments, but for, for other environments as well. Uh, and uh, they, they, they kind of like, uh, these papers look at things like whether the agents can, can learn things like uh, the develop a theory of mind, like can, can project what it's going to do to what an opponent is going to do and, and whether that is actually useful or not. So that's probably the, the closest thing I've seen. Mm -hmm. So, so for the third question, that's from uh, Georg Martius, and uh, and he really likes the talk, uh, and then he continues uh, regarding the shuffling. Uh, normally, we use uh, prior knowledge about the space, like in convolutional networks, uh, to improve generalization. And uh, now you are saying that uh, we should not uh, have it, but instead use uh, only local features. Uh, uh, and so, so what do you think about like uh, this uh, this connection? Like uh, better, we should be using more the yeah, yeah that, that, that's a good question uh, because uh, using net filters is a great inductive bias for generalization for, for image recognition. Uh, but however, uh, is it the best inductive bias? Probably not. Right? So, so in, in uh, this year, we've seen a lot of works in, like outside of my talk, uh, we've seen a lot of works in image recognition where they try to use the transformer architecture to actually learn these inductive biases from data. So they, uh, they throw away the, the concept of convolutional filter and train like a self-attention scheme on a large, like a large data sets so that it can learn maybe better, better inductive biases via the self-attention scheme. Uh, the self-attention scheme is a very flexible method. It, it's kind of like a, like, a, like a hyper network or hyper needs method. Because in a sense, it, it allows you to, to generate an attention matrix, which is kind of like a weight matrix from the data that you've presented. So uh, from, if, if you have a good, good attention scheme, it allows you to, to be more flexible than, than a convolution scheme. So it has been shown that the uh, self-attention can be used to learn maybe better inductive biases compared to ovnets. Because not not everything is strictly uh, uh, position invariance, and I think uh, the work that I presented here is a simplified version of that kind of line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, makes sense. Uh, so I would have uh, one more question myself. Uh, what do you think about like uh, the future research directions uh, when it comes to evaluation of these models? Because it seems. Uh, that many of the say uh, like uh, of these um, games and reinforcement learning tasks are evaluated on exactly the same distribution of the data that they are trained on, 
And uh, what do you think, for example, about the sample efficiency as being maybe better, like objective function than the final score of the agent? There are actually more computational power can just uh, give you the illusion of a uh, of better, better performance. So should people be looking more at the sample efficiency, especially when you uh, test the agents on uh, like out of the distribution, uh, like uh, modifications of the original training examples? Well, that, that's a good question. Like from, from the literature I've seen uh, in the RL community, most people are focused on sample efficiency. So, so like, uh, you know, they, they even, they, uh, the work I talk about in the simple algorithm, they, they define this 100K Atari domain task, which has its problems. But a lot of folks are focused on sample efficiency, but I, to some extent, this is a, an orthogonal focus on out of domain generalization. Uh, and also define tasks where you, you measure zero shot performance on an out of domain generalization. And I think uh, uh, that type of task might be suitable for like scaling up transformers uh, to, to out of domain generalization. Because one, once you're good at out of the domain uh, generalization, maybe in, in zero shot or few shot, you automatically get good sample efficiency without explicitly trying for that. So in, in my like a biased view, I think it's, it's much more interesting to aim for out of domain generalization, or things like zero shot learning, compared to uh, like trying to get better, better sample efficiency. It's, it's also hard as well. Like there's you 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 can have like you know the seed wars. You can have like lucky seeds that give you better sample efficiency. But for things like zero shot generalization, that exists, but it's kind of hard, right? You, you either generalize or you don't. Okay, uh, thanks. There's still like a lot of questions, but uh, we are running out of time, so we'll have to stop here. And uh, I guess you can later answer more of the questions uh, at this Slack. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for your talk. Uh, and it has been like uh, very nice and uh, will hopefully it will motivate uh, researchers to look into, into some new problems in the future. Great. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, I'll chat with you guys later. Bye.